All right. So Dr. Lee, welcome to the podcast. We are officially recording. Ah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks Glad again. To be here. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining me. You know, you really helped me out a lot in this process to um, hopefully match into psychiatry. You were one of my, my favorite preceptors. I got to rotate with you in your clinic um, only two weeks long. So I, I hope I can get more. Um, and so for the listeners, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about Dr. Lee. Um, you did your first part of your medical training in Beijing, correct? Yes. Okay. In Peking University. Awesome. Awesome. And then you completed uh, your, you started out in the neurosurgery world and then yep. switched to uh, neurology, correct? Yes. Yeah. And, and you were training down in University of New Mexico and then you completed a neurophysiology fellowship there as well. Yeah. Well, before then I did a postdoc fellowship at uh, MD Anderson before oh, I, went. Okay. I switched over. So, you know, we came back to do all my boards while I was uh, researching, I guess if you want to call it working researching. Yeah. Crazy. That And, and now <laughs> you are uh, owner of Washington Neurology right here in Yakima, Washington. Um, and, you know, you of course provide the neurology services and then you have some primary care doctors that work in your clinic as well. Yes. And, you know, provide any gaps that, you know, our community needs. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, before I kind of dive into the questions, really one of my favorite parts of your clinic was, was quite frankly, the culture, like people actually liked working there, you know, like, I feel like our, the staff was <laughs> laughing, you know, like having good times with each other. They liked spending time with one another. And, you know, I've, I've worked now or rotated as a medical student at so many clinics uh, yeah, most of them aren't like that. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, part of what you'll, you know, eventually see, and we've had this talk a little bit, I think, if I remember correctly, is that, uh, the, uh, the, the industry is the healthcare industry is, is changing and obviously it's run by numbers, money and analysis and, it gets to a point where there's not much of the, you know, the reasons why I went into medicine in the first place. And which is the reason why we, we became independent. I mean, I, you know, I've been a professor at academic center. I've been to a big hospital, you know, system and as a neurologist and, you know, so that's, and there's pluses and minus on both sides, but, uh, you know, this is, uh, it, to be independent was the way that I was able to do what I felt like, you know, I went into this, into the medicine for, and my wife supports me, which is a big thing. And, uh, <laughs> and that's how we liked it. So, you know, that's how we run things. And, and so I think it carries over to the staff when, you know, they know that they're doing good and, it's not all about money and it's not all about, you know, scheduling and trying to squeeze as many patients in as possible, mm -hmm. or, you know, get through as fast as possible. So um, there's sacrifices, but, you know, in the end, it's, uh, it's life and it's not all about money. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and that's really why I consider you such a role model for me. You know, I, I want to follow a similar career path and, and, you know, hopefully create a clinic where people actually like working at. And, you know, I came from the world of finance and that, and yeah, I don't want to chase after money because I know that's not going to make me happy. I'm just going to, you know, more money, more problems. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, that's cool. What you <laughs> yeah. So, so let's kind of dive into it. Um, you know, one of the things we, I saw the most at your clinic was kind of, we dealt with, of course, a lot of dementia and, you know, yeah. I feel I have parents that are elderly, like this is their ultimate fear of, of, you know, potentially getting dementia. And I feel like kind of more non-medical people always think of dementia strictly as memory issues. And one right. thing that I kind of saw first thing at your clinic was kind of, mood changes as well associated with dementia. So I guess, why is mood also impacted in dementia? Well, um, you have to understand that, first of all, a lot of the dementia is not necessarily something, I think people just assume and get jaded by the idea of a diagnosis of dementia because it's a disease. But the thing is, we've, we all have dementia, to be honest. You know, our, 
you, you have to think that our body has been deteriorating since we peaked on average, which is around 25. And so, you know, it's been downhill since then. And that our brain volume shrinks, you know, it peaks in the growth at 25. And then ever since then, it's been shrinking. And that's, you know, well documented on all the imagings and well understood, but people don't tend to realize that. And as your brain shrinks, yes, is it gonna affect your memory? Absolutely. Who, no one will be able to tell you that their memory is better today than it was 10 years ago. And that's just reality. And if anyone says they do, guess what? They're lying. <laughs> because your brain physically is shrinking, your connections are becoming less, and therefore it's just generally, I guess you have your exceptions to the fact, but you know, but generally it's, you know, not physio physiologically possible. Let's put that mm -hmm. way. Okay. And so, you know, when, so if your brain shrinks, all functions shrink. And that's not just the memory part, the behavior, your, you know, vision, your strength, everything. Mm -hmm. And so that's just the, the process of aging. Can you fight it? Absolutely. You know, we always encourage social socialization because that's practicing your short-term memory. Uh, you have to remember who you're talking to, so their names, so that you can say, be polite and say goodbye with their name. So, that, you know, yeah. And so, like, oh, I forgot what your name again. <laughs> it's kind of rude, right? Yeah. So, so, socialization is practicing short-term memory. And, and so with the memory loss, obviously you're going to have all the other losses gradually too. And so it is, it is basically dementia comes in when at a point where you don't, you no longer have the, a way to compensate for what you forgot. Let's just put it that way. Okay. That's the way I tell patients. So it's like, you know, we forget if our, just think of it as a, a circuit, right? And you have, you have neurons on each and they're all interconnected. And if you lose one neuron and all of a sudden that connection is lost, guess what? You can still reroute it around to other, to get to that same neuron, which is what a lot of times what we do, right? Because if you're a visual learner, then, you know, you're like, you know, you, you remember faces. And so even though I might have forgotten your name, once I see your face, it pop, your name pops up because I rerouted that memory to remember that. Mm -hmm. Well, when dementia comes up, guess what? Even that reroute is no longer there. So that's when there's that disconnect. And so when you have that disconnect, then you start not able to do a lot of your daily stuff, you know, pay your bills or, you know, obviously yeah. you forget. Interesting. Cause again, yeah. I mean, and kind of, I guess the answer I thought you were going to kind of say is one of the best ways to avoid dementia is with exercise, you know, cause I, I think of a lot of dementia processes as restrictive of blood flow, you know, not getting enough blood to the brain. But, you know, when you were kind of talking about socialization, the first thing I had a thing that I popped into my mind is like, wow, I wonder if there's going to be worse dementia or short-term memory loss during times of COVID because we're socializing much less than we would traditionally. And the answer generally would be the assumption would be yes. And, and don't get me wrong. You're absolutely right. The exercise thing has been well proven. The exercise definitely slows down um, dementia. And uh, obviously, you know, the brain needs energy and your, your blood supplies the uh, energy to the brain. So if you're healthier, you're able to supply more and therefore, you know, it will slow down the cell death. Mm -hmm. That's pretty straightforward. And so, yes, I mean, I just want to make sure, you know, that's yeah. a, so, um, but yeah, it's, uh, why do you think um, right now there's such a huge push of, you know, wanting kids to go back to school? Yeah, I guess right. I, yeah. I mean, I didn't even really think of that. I kind of just thought of it more as like of a developmental standpoint, but not really necessarily like a brain process, um, at least memory but, process kind of thing. But it is a developmental process and it is making those brain connections that you, you know, that makes your memory better. That makes you, you know, 
you you don't realize that socialization tends to you know um bring on a lot more promote a lot more other uh mental health issues like you know including not just learning but just you know behavior and and that's all related to connections in your brain because your brain your how you behave which we'll talk to about in when we talk, when we get to TMS, mm-hmm. but same thing. It's all about the neural connections and, you know, how big your prefrontal cortex is and how significant that, what that means. And, and it's all related. I mean, you can't get away from the science. It's pretty, you know, it's been pretty well studied and uh, understood. Yeah. So, yeah. And Actually, you know, a month or so ago, I just completed a child and adolescent psychiatry experience. And yeah, it radically changed kind of my my attitude towards coronavirus and getting kids back in school because I I saw firsthand the destruction that the, that it's causing and, you know, uh, kind of isolation. And of course, in the world of psychiatry, I was thinking more just on moods, but not so much really on on memory processes and and learning. And so, yeah, to kind of hear you say how much socialization can impact all of this is it's, I just hope we can get kids back in school safely as soon as possible. Oh, absolutely. Me too. But the, the key word is safely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Key word. Absolutely. Absolutely. Risking parental death or grandparent death or the kid's illness is sometimes not necessarily worth it. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a year in, a year in the life of a normal person is just a fraction compared to, you know, yeah. sudden death. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, the, the worst, worst case scenario. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, well, so also one question that I get, I feel like a lot from quite frankly, my parents and other people kind of in their same age, should they be taking any like supplements? Like, is, are there certain vitamins that are going to be better to, to avoid dementia processes, especially later in life? And so the answer to that is always yes, but not in the sense that, Hey, whatever's out there, you know, oh, you know, do we go buy all these, you know, dedicated supplements that supposedly make your memory better out there? If you look at the ingredients, it's just vitamins. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the, the, don't get me wrong, um, the vitamins are crucial and it is uh, because they're cofactors to how your, your cells work. And if, your cell, if you can optimize that, that is always good. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't get that from just what you choose to eat. So, um, so there hasn't been any particular things that would that's been shown to be, oh, oh, you need to definitely take this supplement or else you'll get dementia. I mean, there's not because Mm -hmm. your body naturally supplies the nutrition it needs, and that's you know that's not going to change. So it's kind of like the. uh, the old saying of uh, often the questions I get about, you know, uh, traditional medicine, and, you know, traditional medicine and uh, versus, uh, you know, Western medicine, right? Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> it, I always say, yeah, traditional medicine is fine because tr- what traditional medicine is, is basically ingesting, you know, plants and stuff that where the Western medicines derive their medicine from anyway. So it's yeah. like, if you're, if you're eating well and healthy, then you're optimizing your body to fight off anything bad anyway. So there's so but you know, in terms of when you have acute disease, is Western medicine gonna cure that? Not usually, just mm-hmm. saying, mm-hmm. you know, it just needs something more drastic and more potent, I guess. And okay. so in that sense, the answer is, uh, yeah, eating well is fine, but no, there's not any particular supplement that needs to be taken. Yeah. Um, unless you're deficient in it, obviously. And, mm-hmm. you know, which is the reason why we screen people for B12 because B12 deficiency definitely can cause a, um, pseudo dementia type, uh, behavior. So, yeah. 
Yeah. And then, and I, you know, especially for the senior citizens, I know a lot of them, of course, are on like a fixed income that's probably rather low. And sometimes a lot of those vitamins can be quite expensive. And it's yeah. like, you can, you can get a lot of those same nutrients if you just eat very healthy, you know, getting folate, you know, from like spinach kind of thing. And, and just, so, you know, I kind of think it's a mixed bag. I kind of agree with you. Um, so I kind of want to shift our conversation a little bit more now towards headaches. You know, that's something, of course, we dealt with a lot in your clinic. Um, so one thing I, I remember that that's going to stick with me for the rest of my life is how you tried to explain the physiology of how headaches occur, maybe most specifically like a migraine headache or an occipital kind of headache and, and um, the relationship of blood vessels to nerves actually in your cranium. Can you explain that? Uh, absolutely. So, um, you know, uh, first of all, let me preface something. This is, there is multiple theories on, on migraines, but, uh, you know, a lot of them all make sense. And so when, when I'm explaining to people about the migraines, you know, I'm applying one of the, the more common believed is theory because there's not really a way to test that it's true, but it makes sense. And so the idea is that <clears throat> there's a bottleneck effect to triggers of headaches. And usually it's a, it's a sudden change in blood pressure. And that's why when you go look up or Google what causes headache, you pretty much will find everything and anything because everything and anything could get your blood pressure up suddenly. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the idea is that it's uh, the theory of one of the most common triggers is the trigeminal nerve, which is your facial sensory nerve. And it's also one of the more sensitive nerves because in, in humans, most of our nerves are in our hands, our feet and our face because we're, you know, we've de developed that way so that we can manipulate things with our hands. That's why we're able to make the things we do. Right. And when we're bipedal, we're walking on two feet, and, and then we're also social animals and that a lot of it's dealt with the face and how we express ourselves between each other. And so that's where a lot of the majority of nerve is and trigeminal nerve, obviously being the sens sensation nerve of your face is one of the big, more sensitive nerves because there's a lot of nerves to it. And that being said, the thought is that it's a dilation of a, you know, a blood vessel, you know, when the blood pressure goes up, that brings it as blood vessels or arteries are run always oftentimes run along with the nerves are just a little too close, which is the genetic factor that I theorize and, um, or hypothesize, sorry. And, um, and that, increase in blood pressure would dilate that blood vessel to pound on the nerve because your heart's beating. So your blood vessel is always beating. So it's going to pound on the, on the nerve that then triggers this wave of suppression that is well documented in um, functional MRIs to show a wave of suppression that can go from the front of the head to the back or the back of the head to the front. And <clears throat> that has been well um, researched to be associated oftentimes with the auras that people get with migraines. And so if you think of it that way, you understand why the, the, why the medications for headaches work the way they work. So there's the, generally for four classes of medication, your blood pressure medication, right? And then I'll get a little technical here. So it's not all blood pressure medications, but specifically the beta blockers and the calcium channel blockers. And these are two classes of medications that tend to have a regulatory factor to the heart, to your heart rate. So you have to uh, go, so jumping back a little bit, if you understand the uh, physiology of your, of your body, your, your heart's like a pump. And so the faster it pumps, the more blood it pumps out, the higher the pressure, right? So if I cap that, then you can't, you have a harder time spiking that blood pressure suddenly therefore not able to dilate that blood vessel as much to get too close to the nerve, to pound on it, to inflame the nerve, to then trigger that wave of suppression. And so if you think of it that way, then that's how these medications, that's how that one medications work. The second and third class is the anti-seizure medications and the anti-depression medications, and only specifically the tricyclic class of the anti-depression medications. And so if you 
to explain how those work is pretty easy. They just work, they work similar, but in a different mechanism. And that needs a little bit of background. So seizure medications, if you know what seizures are, it's basically a hyperactivity of the brain. And, you know, oftentimes I say a short circuiting of the brain. And so if you, and that's why we can actually see it on an EEG, which measures our brain waves. And so, you know, I oftentimes equate it to a computer. If a seizure is like a, uh, a spark that's going off inside and you can't see it. So you're fine. You look normal. The computer looks normal, but there's a wire that's just sparking off inside and it's not doing anything because, you know, it's a closed circuit, right? You're not using that part mm-hmm. of that sparking off. But when you start stressing out and you're doing too many things and you're over operating your brain, guess what? That energy flows in a computer is going to be more prevalent. And eventually that flow will get through, through or to that spark and then spread to the other places. And then all of a sudden energy that's supposed to be contained in, let's say the video card or whatever word program that you're supposed to do all of a sudden runs to everything else. And then all of a sudden the computer is going crazy and running Mm -hmm. at hundred percent. Right. And that's the reason why people go into convulsions because every muscle, once that spreads out and they go into seizure, every single muscle in your body is going off at the same time. And like a computer, we have self-protective mechanisms. What does a computer do? It throws up the blue screen. It's like, hey, hey, I don't like mm-hmm. to operate 100%. I like my teens, you know? <laughs> I like yeah. to be able to chill out. And so, so you're able to, so the brain does the same thing. It's like, hey, I don't, I don't like running 100%, right? So they throws up blue screen. That's when you just kind of collapse and the seizure stops, mm-hmm. right? What do you do after that? You turn off the computer and you reboot, which mm-hmm. is that post state afterwards where you're confused, right? And, you know, oftentimes people don't recall any of the seizure patients don't even know they had one unless they had a clue, like they wet themselves or yeah. pooped their pants or bit their mouth or tongue. <clears throat> and so the reason why is the uh, same thing as a computer. Can you actually save anything while the computer is going haywire or you're rebooting? And the answer is no. Therefore, your brain does the same thing. You cannot save a memory when everything's going crazy or when you're rebooting. That's why seizure patients don't remember. Sorry for the tangential there, but uh, <laughs> so the, how the seizure medication works then is that it suppresses that neuron. So it doesn't allow that spark to spread to the other neurons as quickly. It's not curative. It's more of a, it raises a threshold. So it doesn't mm-hmm. allow that seizure to break out as easy. Right. And so if it can suppress a neuron, guess what's also suppressing that painful pounding on the blood vessel. And therefore it's not going to be as easily triggered into that wave of suppression of a nerve of the migraine. And so if you think of it as that dulling the nerve or suppressing the pain aggravation of the nerve, then that's why these, all the seizure medications are a whole class of medications for also for migraines. The tricyclic class, specifically the, the C, TCH, I mean, TCA classes, is um, does kind of the same thing. And um, not to offend anyone, so I'm going to just make it very simple and not being trying to be insensitive, but it might sound a little bit like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> first, but, you know, um, as some of the people who are depressed may know, certain types of depression uh, are rooted in a overthinking. Some people who are depressed will tell you that their mind can never shut off. It just keeps running. Things are just going through their mind. They can't go to sleep because things things are just just too much to handle. You know, well, guess what? If that, if you can dull the nerve, then you basically kind of dumb up, dumb it up a little bit so that you don't overthink and therefore you don't stress out as easily. Okay. And if, you do this, if you can do the same thing, then it works the same way as this, the seizure medications at dulling the nerve so it doesn't aggravate as easily with the pounding and therefore preventing the, you know. Mm-hmm. The migraine, yeah. Migraine suppression. And doubling over, it also treats you know, as the trigger, because if you're overthinking, then you're easily stressed. You can spike up the blood pressure easy. So if you're 
more calm, then you're less likely. So it kind of treats in two different ways. Yeah. That. And the last class is a CGRP class, which you often see on commercials now, the injectable classes. And that's a, uh, a peptide that signals, guess what? The blood pressure, the blood vessels to dilate. So if I can inhibit that, then you have no signaling mechanism to tell that blood vessel to dilate. Therefore, you can't get it close enough to pound on the nerve. And that's why that class works. So it, you, know, you can understand why everything's kind of tied to this. So then going back to <clears throat> the blood pressure spiking and dilating of the blood vessels, what's the statistic, statistically number one class of, med, of causes is well understood by far is stress. We stress, our blood pressure goes up. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what other causes, what other things can cause uh, migraines or headaches? Physical activity, right? Mm -hmm. You're an athlete, you know, after you play sports, your head is pounding, boom, 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 right? Or physical exertion type, because when we exert, we do what they call a sun salva movement, and that's a squeezing of the chest. And that just squeezes your heart just enough to, to, to get that extra blood pushed out to spike up the blood pressure to dilate that blood vessel, right? Mm -hmm. And so... So that's, that's the mechanism for that cause, right? What well, other things can cause, you know, things, getting sick, allergies, right? Um, even weather changes, right? How do these all work? Very similar, very similar. You think about it and you, you can you figure this out. Um, when you get sick, right? It's, when you get sick and allergies, basically the same. So if you have an invading um, virus or bacteria or, a, or antigen with the allergies, right, into your body, how does your body fight it off? The white blood cells have to recognize that it's it's uh, not it doesn't belong to your body, and they chews it up and spits it out. But unlike all those videos that you see where white blood cells are able to track down. You know, like do, 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 like a yeah. Pac-Man video game. <laughs> Your body doesn't do that, right? Because guess what? They don't leave a trail on a plate where they can actually follow. You know, in your in your body, it's, it's all in the blood circulation, right? And cells don't swim. <laughs> <laughs> so guess what? Your body has to do. It has to pump faster to increase the circulation, right? To increase the chance of that white blood cell running into that, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why when you're sick, you're flushed, you're sweating because all your blood vessels are open because it's trying to increase the blood flow to try to get to hit that antigen or, bac or bacteria or virus, right? To get rid of it. And so you can understand all the physiological changes of the, not, not only you're flushing the sweating because now your blood is up and you're, evaporating heat, which is going to cause you sweat, right? That's the reason why all of a sudden when you get sick, you can get a, it can get a headache. Same thing with allergies, except with allergies, not in the blood, it's usually in the tissue. So, you know, that's why you get the swelling effect, right? Which is the same thing as, as trying to increase flow to that area to get the white blood cells seep through to get rid of the antigens. And so all that ties to the heart which means that it has to beat faster and then that spikes the blood pressure and then it triggers the headaches that mm -hmm. runs along with, it, right? And then people always say, well, then how do you explain the, uh, the barometric changes that, you know, trigger migraines? Easy, right? What are bar barometric changes? It's usually a sudden drop in temperature, right? Okay. So if it's a sudden drop in temperature, you know, because a lot of migraines will tell you, it's like, uh, there's a storm coming. Why? Uh, I'm getting a migraine. <laughs> <laughs> right? And uh, and the answer to that is because of the barometric change or the temperature drop. So, again, going back to the physiology, our skin is, you know, how we regulate our temperature. Our body likes a nice even temperature, right? And so in the warm room, your skin is pink because it's dilating all your cap your capillary beds to 
get the blood to the surface to evaporate the heat so that you can balance the temperature out. So that's why your skin's pink. But if you walk out to the freezing cold of Yakima winters here, right? Mm -hmm. What does your skin do? Yeah. Closes up. That's why you go pale in the cold. Well, the question becomes, is your blood volume change? No. No. Yeah. It, it doesn't change that easily. Your blood volume's the same, right? But then you're pretty much taking a gallon of, you know, if the milk is your blood and you take it, you, you have a gallon container, you just basically squeeze it in half, right? Because all the capillary beds in your skin suddenly go boom, closing up. What's that going to do to the milk? Shoot right to, through the top. Mm -hmm. right? Guess where the top is? Right there. And therefore triggering, dilating the blood vessel to the head and triggering a migraine. Interesting. Interesting. Right? Yeah. That makes sense? Absolutely. So, yeah. And, and, you know, uh, for the listeners, you know, most of our listeners on this podcast are actual medical students and pre-med students. So even though we dove kind of in the weeds of the, the science there, I, I think the listeners will really kind of appreciate that. We have a lot of uh, kind of students pursuing the medical field. And, you know, Dr. Lee, one, one thing that I really liked, you know, about your style is you were willing to kind of self-disclose some things to your patients. And, you know, you know, my style, I'm very open about um, my bipolar disorder. Um, and I really liked how you were open about your own experiences with migraines. And obviously I don't think migraines and, and bipolar disorders <laughs> disclosure are exactly the same, but, you know, maybe similar. So one of my favorite stories is when you would explain how you kind of overcame your management of migraines. And from my understanding, it was not really through pharmacology. No. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's funny how we all kind of grow into ourselves and, you know, maybe that has something to do with why I became a neurologist in the first place, but, you know, I've had migraines since I was 10 and, you know, I read the physiology, which is what, you know, thank God my dad was a doc and I'm going to date myself a little bit back then there was no internet, so I couldn't, you know, exactly research it. So you go to the encyclopedia and everything's like, well, everything and anything causes headaches. And you're like, great, that doesn't tell me. Anything. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so, you know, but in, I was, because my dad was a doc, I was able to, you know, read up a little bit on it and realize that, uh, yes, it's, uh, you know, yeah, the theory has, the theories have not changed in decades. It's all the same still. Right. And so for me, then, you know, as a 10 year old, nothing's going to stop a person from playing so you tend you just go play so you live with it and you do yeah and i did and so you know i was able to figure out what my triggers were external triggers were but uh i still was having one or two migraines a week easily right but because i had it so young i learned to live with it and you know i kind of fell into what caused my problem and you know well, what was my main trigger accidentally? And, you know, when I became, and that's when I became a uh, faculty at the university, a professor. Um, <clears throat> when I became a professor, all of a sudden my headaches went away, my migraines went away. Within six months, it went from, you know, one or two a week down to almost one or two a year, right? Immediately. And I was like, you know, talking to patients, I used to be able to relate because I just had one. And then I couldn't even remember the last time I did. Mm -hmm. And I had, you know, all this is in retrospect, obviously. And, you know, so, I, you know, the story I usually share with patients is that, uh, you know, it's just more personal story. And then I let, allow my patients to kind of derive whatever they, lessons they want to learn from it. Um, is this, you know, um, my, so it's an, again, sorry for the side story, <laughs> but my, uh, that's, that's what we're here for on talk about the health of Logan too. <laughs> Don't worry about it, Dr. Lee, you know, but, uh, my, my dad is the oldest of six brothers. So six brothers, no, no, uh, sisters. My grandfather was the only child. And so when my brother was born, he was the, uh, firstborn male. So in a traditional Taiwanese family, that is a big thing because name passed down, 
you know, big celebration. Hoo-hoo, right? I'm number two, and that's two of 20-some cousins. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Six brothers, right? So, <laughs> um, and so, you know, basic attitude was, oh, congratulations. Call us when you have a girl. <laughs> And then my, then my sister comes along and she's the first girl in three generations. Oh, wow. Right. Even bigger celebration than uh, my brother. Right. And so if it was bad, if it wasn't bad enough that I was the middle child, I was the middle child of two siblings that were the favorites of the whole family because of the position they were born. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Right. And so Going back and looking through photos, I was always the kid that was doing weird stuff, you know, in pictures. The one trying to run out of pictures, the one making faces, the one doing really weird, you know, postures. And my brother and sister were always the angelic ones. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, growing up, I started figuring out that how I got attention was when I excelled. And so I, my job was to beat my brother or my goal motivation was to be my brother at whatever he did. So if you got straight A's, I got straight A pluses. If you guys varsity jacket in junior year, I got in sophomore year. And so I just did everything better. But to do that, you had to learn to be a very good people pleaser, meaning you had to live to other people. You have to know what others expect of you and exceed it. Right which is basically a people pleaser. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, it got to a point where, you know, I was doing it without even knowing I was doing it, you know? And to those that are in the medical field, they they would understand this. So, you know, um, I, I went from intern year to residency, to fellowship, to staying professor, all at the same university. Mm -hmm. and so um you know that's not very common in our field usually because as each step goes up there's less and less spaces and so the funny thing is i didn't even want it that was the that's the thing you know it's like you know as you know the chief resident i thought i was done i was going to go out make my money and finally be independent you know pay off my debts and, you know, start living a life. And then my mentor um, comes to me and is like, hey, you know that spot, that fellowship spot, George, right? I didn't see your application. And I was like, oh, crap. (laughs) I thought I got past that, you know? You had to apply a year and a half before. Mm -hmm. Already starting my last year. And so I was like, "Uh, but this is the guy that wrote the textbook on that all neurologists are, you know, one of the two EEG textbooks that all neurologists read. So you don't say no to mm-hmm. a silver spoon handed to you. And so, you know, it's like, oh, sorry, boss. I must have forgotten, <laughs> you know, when you hand in your application and okay, fine. Now I'm a fellow. All right. Fellowship done. Ready to get out there, make my money, pay off my debts, start living your life, you know? My other mentor comes to me and he's like, hey, Tony, you know, uh, we're short on faculty. Can you stick around? <laughs> I'm like, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> you know how much professors make? Yeah. Less than half of what I would make outside. Right? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> but then, you know, that news got to my dad, who's an academic professor, okay. a doctor. And so, you know. He comes to me and he's like, you know, son, I am so proud of you that you are following my footsteps and becoming a professor. And I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the guy that I've been trying to get attention of all my life, you know, obviously besides my mom and both of them, um, all of a sudden he says he's proud of me. They, they, you know, as a, as a people pleaser, the one to try to get attention, am I going to say no to that? Hell no. Fine. I'll stick around. But 
find someone to replace me and uh, and I'm gone, mm-hmm. right? Once you find someone, then I'm gone. Well, once you become a professor, guess what? You don't have any, any mentors looking over you anymore. You don't have anyone to report to anymore. I'm the, I'm the head honcho now, right? And I joke around like, and now I'm Dr. McDreamy, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one walking down the hallway and I have an entourage of uh, residents and fellows uh, and nurses, you know. Easily medical and, students. <laughs> and medical students. And, uh, you know, you don't have to lift a finger to do much. And, you know, the uh, whoever's the senior resident take, takes lead and goes around and you teach a little bit, which I love to do anyways. And <clears throat> you go home. Notes are done. You just read it through, make sure you edit a few things and sign off and that's it. Life was good. It was simple, you know, so well that I was able to ride my bike and stay healthy, going to work and coming home and, you know, financially was, yes, I wasn't making that much, but at least I'm not penny pinching at the end of the month anymore. And, you know, it was comfortable. So, um, so life was good. And then to be honest, if it wasn't, because uh, my wife and I lost a baby during pregnancy um, and she couldn't stand living in that city anymore because every place reminded her of the pregnancy and gave me an ultimatum to leave <laughs> or else she'll leave by herself. <laughs> I think I would have ended up staying and uh, I, I would have just kept going, you know? And, uh, but, you know, life has a way of throwing you kinks and happy wife is happy life. So absolutely, you know, I, uh, so we moved and so that being said, that's the, that's the basis of the story because, you know, going back and thinking through, you know, my biggest problem was the character flaw. Uh, I'm always trying to please other people. And once I had no one else to please, besides my wife and you know she's always been very supportive so it's not demanding of me so that I felt like I was having to keep you know not meeting expectations obviously all of a sudden that weight lifted off of me and majority of my headaches went away and so you know now I pay extra attention to those that are doing the same thing and if I could just change one person's life for the better so that they don't have to suffer through as many headaches as I, I did, then I've done my job. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I agree with you. And, and, you know, I, I like, you know, as, as I'm not a doctor yet, but once I do become, you know, I feel like so many problems in medicine we assume can only be solved with medication, but there's so many other factors that can impact disease and, and, or headaches, you know, simply, you know, do managing stress, changing uh, job responsibilities. And not everyone's of course capable of, of doing all those things, but it can have such a wonderful impact, positive impact on someone's life. And I think that's kind of a good segue to, to the next topic I want to talk about. W- one thing I talk, you know, literally probably every episode on this show is I think one of the best ways to manage stress, if you can't change your job, if you can't do all these things is through meditation and just being able to put your stress kind of in the proper perspective, you know, not, not having it be so overwhelming in your life. And, you know, one thing I know you did your fellowship in was in uh, electroencephalograms, um, EEGs. And so for listeners who don't understand what it is, that's when, um, you know, you could hook up all the wires to your brain and you can read brain waves. Um, and just so, just so the listeners understand, you know, as medical students, we understand how to interpret EKGs, which is, uh, the electrical signals of the heart, but they don't even touch on EEGs really, uh, because it's just so complicated. I remember one day walking into your office, Dr. Lee, uh, and I tried to assist in interpreting an EKG and I just thought you were staring at witchcraft. I was so utterly confused. (laughs) And I I hope one day I get a much better understanding of it and maybe I can incorporate it into my psychiatric practice. Um, But why I kind of all bring this up is, you know, when someone is meditating, would you see changes in their EEG brainwaves? Uh, absolutely. And so, again, there, there's there been plenty of studies done on this, and I'll just simplify it very, uh, make it easy. Meditation is a state of calm and a relaxation. 
And that is just a balance between going to sleep. <laughs> so in your, in, in that sense, you end up seeing um, a, during meditations, you end up seeing a slowing of your brain waves, which is associated oftentimes with drowsiness and falling asleep. And so you're in that uh, drowsy state, which is oftentimes, you know, um, thought to be more receptive and why med meditations are calming because you're falling asleep. Oh, and okay. That mid, is that mid stage between your, is that stage between wake and REM sleep, that falling asleep part. Okay. And so you float right in, in that area when you're doing your meditations. Interesting. Very cool. So then I guess it's that, that then, you know, so a lot of times on the show, I talk about meditation doesn't have to be kind of the traditional, like, you know, sit with your legs crossed, ooh, wah, 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 and just breathing through your nose, right? Like I talk a lot about how I view riding my bicycle as a form of meditation kind of thing. You know, when I'm on that bike cruising, I'm not thinking about anything else, but it's certainly not uh, you know, entering into like sleep waves. So like, what would you see on someone's EEG when they're in like that flow state of mind, like me riding my bicycle? Same thing, not necessarily to the, to the drowsy point, but definitely in a relaxed state. So, um, you have to think of your, your brain, um, when you're in that state, you're much more relaxed. It's almost that you just, all you're focusing is pedaling and you're breathing right in your bike. And I say, and you're absolutely right about how you choose to decide what kind of, uh, how do you go about meditating? Because for me, it's simple. I take a hot bath, I sit in my massage chair every day, I come back home and that relaxes me. But for my wife and you, so they like, you know, she likes to do something. She goes and, you know, she joins an MMA gym and tosses people around to relax. <laughs> you know, so, so. You know, so and so it, everyone works a little bit differently. And so, you know, but it is that that point in in time where your mind is relaxed and just focused on one thing. So you don't over you're not overactive on your brain and that is just floating again right at the I'm not saying that you're falling asleep on your bike, but, you know, you definitely you know, in a calmer spot in your brain when you only have to focus on a couple of things, mm -hmm. right? The brain's not active all over the place and you're just focusing on your breathing and your pedaling. And so, you know, the, the motor area where you're pedaling and your breathing, which is in your midbrain, and that's it. The rest of the brain kind of calms down because it's not being needed, right? Mm -hmm. Which is almost a state of relaxation. Same Absolutely, thing. yeah. And so, so it is... So yeah, it, it is that. So you still see that slowing, but you know, not necessarily to the point where you're about to fall asleep. Okay, rad, rad, cool. Well, kind of the last part of this, uh, this podcast that I want to talk about is transcranial magnetic stimulation therapy, TMS. And, uh, you know, you're a neurologist. Um, and, but this is really kind of like a new hot issue in psychiatry, um, even though I think it was FDA approved in like 1995 or something. Um, mm. But this is potentially a treatment um, for depression. And uh, for individuals who have really not found a good therapy that that's working all that well for them. I know you have some TMS machines in your office. I really loved uh, that experience getting to learn about these machines and, and talk to the patients that benefited from them. So kind of, can you tell us about like how TMS got started? Um, well, from my understanding, uh, it was actually, and believe it or not, that's the reason why Nira and Psych are, in this uh, on the same board because there's a lot of crossover mm -hmm. um because ultimately how you behave is how your brain functions and so there's there's the crossover and he, and again and sorry another side story um even uh when they came out with the uh the meg which is the magnetic e encephalogram which is the basically a combined eeg with uh mri okay it basically allows you to see your brain waves, not just only on the surface of the brain, like the EEGs, mm -hmm. but this penetrates throughout the whole entire brain. 
Okay. And so, you know, there's not a lot of these machines and there were where I went to the university I went had was one of the places that originally created it or you know, part of it. So they had an animal version and an adult version, you know, wow. <laughs> right next to each other. So it's pretty amazing stuff to, to, uh, to learn. And guess what? It wasn't used by neurologists that much to do research because we kind of already know the structures of the brain and what it did. Most of the research on the Meg were people like you who are in psychiatry that wanted to figure out, was there anything more um, <clears throat> uh, uh, objective to pinpoint any of the causes of psychiatric diseases? So funny enough, a lot of the EEG stu MEG studies were all based on, were more psychiatric than anything else, right? And again, TMS is the kind of the uh, crossover of the two and um, how it was eventually developed was because of the MRIs and because of the studying of psychiatry and because of the studies that were done, people were, getting routine MRIs. And even though they figured out that there wasn't anything on the functional MRIs um, that could diagnose depression because depression is a constant fluctuation of your certain activity of, the, of uh, particular areas in the brain, um, it fluctuates. It's like people are not always depressed. So it's not yeah. like they, they could just measure a marker and say, hey, look at that. That's mm -hmm. diagnosis of depression, right? Because they could be happy one minute and which then the levels are up and then the serotonin levels are up and then they'd be sad again and the serotonin down. So it fluctuates. So there's nothing on the, that allows them to use that to diagnose. But what ha ended up happening was because the people who participated got so many MRIs, most of them started feeling better anyways. <laughs> and, and, you know, therefore they realized that, you know, in, treating MRIs um, basically is just a big magnet. And, um, but as you know, a magnet creates polarity. And if, um, as the med students know, or healthcare, they know the brain works on electricity, right? Electricity works on positive and negative ions that uh, exchange through the membrane to create a pulse. So if you think of it, how the TMS works is basically creates a magnetic field where it allows that distinction of that positive and negative to separate to then create a pulse, to then excite the neurons to then create, a, create its effect. And that's how the TMS technology was born. Okay. And, and kind of my understanding of, of the theories of of how this works, you know, is, is kind of threefold. And I'd love to kind of hear your opinion and kind of guide my learning. And, and sure. so, you know, uh, it possibly like that magnetic field can increase some of the blood flow into the brain. And, and maybe this is having, uh, some sort of positive effect on depression. Maybe it's increasing uh, both blood and, and spinal fluid into the cranium. Um, another theory that I kind of researched is potentially it's increasing uh, metabolism in the region stimulated. I know the machine you have in your office, it targets the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, which is kind of an area for uh, regulation of behavior, um, appetite changes, sleep changes, energy level changes. And, and then the last is potentially it releases kind of a slew of neurotransmitters. Um, right. So we're not exactly sure what's going on, but do you have any theories? Do you think one theory is, is stronger than the other of why people are benefiting from this? Um, no, I think, to be honest, I think it's a combination of all of it. Okay. Because, um, and I'll try to explain that. Um, obviously, the, you know, dorsal lateral part of the frontal cortex is part of the limbic system that regulates our behavior, right? And it's all interconnected, right? And it basically allows release of all the different types of uh, neurotransmitters, not just the serotonin or like what the, some of the antidepressant drugs target, um, 
but you know the dopamine the norepinephrine the epinephrine so it targets everything and ex- basically over excites the whole system in itself to release all of that and that will help you regulate um your behavior just by exciting the limbic system so so in that sense it will help in treating depression now going to the circulation thing it absolutely will also cause that because we have iron in your in our blood in our red blood cells Mm -hmm. so again it's a magnet so iron is magnetic so if you're turning on magnet in your brain guess what's going to suck up blood into your head so that increases flow to to your brain overall and even more to the area that you're focused on if it's a focal magnet and so Therefore, supplying that area with, with blood, which then increases the energy it supplies, right? And also, so it will further um, promote the excitability, I guess, of mm-hmm. uh, that region. And so, um, NCSF is just a product of blood, not so much so it's CSF, okay. you know, because of, uh, you know, Yeah, never really thought about the CSF part. Okay, but maybe because it doesn't have that like kind of ion component that wouldn't be as as impacted by the magnetic field. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I think it's definitely a combination of the two, and okay. it's not the one thing because the even though it's a focal magnet, you have to understand that it's a system of of that is throughout the whole head, right? Mm-hmm. It's your midbrain. It's your you know frontal cortex, a single gyrus loops all the way around, includes to your, to your temporal lobes, to your memory. So it excites all of that. And therefore, you know, it's, it's trying to raise that baseline. And that's the reason why you need the repetitive amount of test, uh, treatments because it prompts your brain to keep up at that same baseline. Okay. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, just so the listeners um, kind of understand, Dr. Lee kind of touched on. So my understanding of TMS is that you would be going daily for about four to six weeks more about Is Is that what your practice looks like with TMS? Uh, it's actually six weeks and, okay. uh, and a weaning period of three. And so it's okay. daily or not daily, but five days a week for okay. the first weeks. And then the next week, every other day, and then the the you know the eighth week is two in a week, and then the last week is just one treatment. And you know, it, does it have to be that? The answer is no. But that's what the protocols that they the research and the the FDA approval was done, and that's how it's passed. So you know, you kind of have to go by that. Yeah. So, yeah. But, but it, it just reinforces the idea that it is, should be daily and it's not a long treatment. It's only the, in treating most average, only about 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the setup in your office, I thought was just awesome. You know, these patients would be uh, kind of sitting in the chair with like the, you know, the TMS machine over their head. I'll, I'll post a photo on Instagram of a TMS machine, not yours, but they, then there was like a big television screen and people would be watching YouTube or Netflix kind of just really enjoying themselves. Yeah. So yeah. what, what kind of patients should, should potentially consider TMS therapy? I'll be honest. Um, all patients are depressed, <laughs> okay. which is a lot of people. But, you know, again, this is the how our system doesn't make any sense because, you know, a lot of the insurances will want usually regulate a failure of uh, certain like anywhere from one to four antidepressants before they will approve this treatment for, for the patient. Okay. And so, you know, um, but my personal opinion is that why take a pill when you have something that's non-invasive, you know, with very minimal side effects you know, versus taking a pill that could potentially have more. Mm-hmm. Just saying, 
you know. And, and something that, you know, a pill you'd have to take every single day, whereas this is something, uh, you know, six weeks, you know, it's, it's not necessarily forever. Um, yeah. But, you know, I guess here's where we're, I'm a little confused, you know, do some people use TMS as that's their only treatment or, and also some people use it kind of in conjunction with medication they're already on? Um, so the idea of the treatment is that whatever you're already on, we stay because if you play around with your meds during the time um, after the treatment of the TMS or during the treatment of TMS, you might cancel out the effects. Okay. You know, for example, if the TMS is working for you and helping you with your depression, but then you decide that you're going to take off a medication and that made your depression worse, then that just canceled it out. And then you just, mm. you didn't, you know, you come out not feeling like anything's different. So our protocol is to have patients stay on their meds at least for the next year, unless there's some, you know, side effects or some other thing that absolutely requires them to be off of a certain medication, then that's fine. But, you know, but in general, if we're doing a TMS and we want to see how well the TMS is working, we try to have the patient stay on the same meds um, throughout the treatment and even past that to a whole year if possible. And that's also how the research was done. And, um, you know, and 50, I mean, the, the uh, success rates are pretty incredible. I mean, much higher than any pill out there. Yeah. Right. I mean, the, the numbers looking at is pretty much looking at 67 to 80% in reducing major depression down to mild or none. Right. Mm -hmm. Versus what first pill is in the 30%. 20, yeah. yeah, 30%. yeah. It's you terrible. That, it's half that you mm -hmm. feel that again, you know, by the fourth, you're down to 1%. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really sad. It, it's really unfortunate. And I, and I hope that TMS can be like a wonderful um, kind of like intervention that hopefully we can use. Um, so what, what side effects do patients potentially experience going through TMS? Well, the most common side effects is uh, a, usually in the first week is headaches. And that's understandable because we just talked about migraines and how blood rushing to the head causes headaches. Well, if the magnet's pulling the blood into your head, guess what? It's going to cause headaches. So the way we try to counter that is that when the, when the treatment's going on, we have you breathe out. So when you breathe out, you collapse your lung, and then that opens up the heart bigger so that it, counts, oh, okay. it, drops, the, it drops the blood pressure out of your head so it counters that pull in. So it minimizes that. But um, usually your body adjusts this really quick. So... You know, we also suggest that, you know, some if people are get, getting some headaches, they might want to take a NSAID or a Tylenol, Advil mm -hmm. right, right before the treatment. But that's only usually required on the first week. After that, you know, they get so used to it, they okay. don't even need to, they don't get headaches anymore and um, they don't need to take anything anymore. So, okay, rad. And, and so kind of another thing is, I guess, who shouldn't use TMS therapy? And, and kind of my understanding of it, at least now, it's it's quite frankly someone like me, someone who has has a, a psychotic episode before. I had a manic episode about ten years ago, um, or maybe if you had had some elements of psychosis, uh, some certain types of depression do have uh, psychotic features. Um, so if you do have anything like that, you're not appropriate for TMS, correct? In theory. Okay. But see, that's the, again, that's what the uh, research have shown. And in theory, that makes sense. So you can, if you understand the idea is that it's exciting the brain. Well, when you're in the manic episode, your brain is overrunning. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, and so, you know, if you, if someone has a tendency to allow the brain to overrun, guess what's going to happen if you're exciting the brain, you might actually trigger that manic episode mm -hmm. so in theory yes have have we treated patients that has had manic episodes yes and you know we warned them about it they told them but they you know and they actually did fine and they actually were very it did help so you know because again you have to understand that the brain is your brain waves are not static 
Mm -hmm. it fluctuates your brain activity fluctuates so it's not like you know am i gonna go treat someone while they're in the midst of a manic episode no (laughs) 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 but you know but you can understand why that that is uh one of the well it's considered one of the contraindications for the insurances but you know okay Again, but it could still, of course, be considered, um, you know, like, like you touched on. Right. And then obviously, again, the, the other obvious cause is any metal in the head. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, because of the magnet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that one's at least absolute. They're definitely not going to do it. Yeah, that respect. Well, that's you know, pretty much it, you know, it's. Yeah, I, I did a whole presentation actually at my school on, on TMS and um, uh, ECT, electroconvulsion therapy. And, you know, there's such a negative stigma around ECT. Um, however, it, it does work. Um, yeah. And in my limited research, it ECT actually works a little bit better than TMS. They both have positive effects on depression, um, but ECT can potentially have a little bit more profound of an effect. However, one thing that TMS does not have is like all the negative memory kind of loss impacts that ECT potentially has. And you don't need an anesthesiologist. In my understanding, it's a much less uh, cost to the patient and and to the health system as a whole. Absolutely. And uh, like I said, it's not as invasive and not as dangerous not even dangerous i would almost say Mm -hmm. you know um versus the uh, ect but yes you're absolutely right does ect work yeah i mean it's you know the research have shown it so that's why it still exists so but I mean, to even find, I mean, here in Yakima to get an ECT provider, I, don't, I think you'd have to go all the way to Spokane or all the way to Seattle. To my knowledge, there's no one that does it in this area. Um, no. You know, if you are in the central Washington area, I hope you would consider visiting Washington Neurology. Um, you know, I think your clinic is, is just awesome and, and look into TMS and the other services that you provide. Um, you know, Dr. Lee, thank you so much uh, for coming on the show. I, you know, you've talked to me for over an hour. This has been really awesome. I've really, really enjoyed this um is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners no no no. it was uh it was my pleasure and uh you know it's uh i I love what you do and i love your how you guys are innovating healthcare and doing stuff like this and getting the word out and educating the public which is what you know doctors were are supposed to do so Mm -hmm. you know uh, yeah yeah, I, mean, I, I very get very proud of you, Logan. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Dr. Lee. And, and you know, you, you provided me, uh, obviously, with a letter, a tangible thing, but you know, uh, as like a role model who I who I emulate to be like, you know, once I finally graduate residency and, and hopefully have my own clinic. Um, I, I hope TMS is one of those things that's that really becomes commonplace. It's in like every primary care clinic in the nation, you know, cause so many, every single family doctor is treating countless amount of people with depression. Um, mm-hmm. So hopefully we just continue to see this rolled out further and further and further. Cause I think it can have so many wonderful impacts for people. Same here. Uh, yeah. I forgot to, so got to change the healthcare system first though, but start yeah. with you guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> 